Okay, now let's start with part A, which covers MFRS 8 Supplemental Reporting. Okay, first, the company background, DKLS Industries Berhad. DKLS Industries Berhad is one of Malaysia's leading conglomerates and has been listed in in the main board of Bursa Malaysia since 2001. Uh, it is majorly an investment holding company. The company is engaged in the provisions of management services. This company has subsidiaries which are DKLS Construction Number High, is a building and general contractor and is engaged in sales or related product. Second is DKLS Precast System Number High, DKLS Development Number High, DKLS Premier Home Number High is engaged in construction and development of properties. Third is DKLS Marketing Number High, is engaged in trading of construction materials, hardware. Uh, kitchen and sanitary wares. Fourth is DKLS Lake View Number High and DKLS Equity Center Number High. Is engaged in investment holding and lastly is DKLS Home Builder Center Number High, which is engaged in filing, removal, extraction, and sales of merchantable timbers. Okay, next is management approach. There is a factor to consider in having a segment reporting. Okay, first, nature of the products and services. DKLS Industries perhaps nature is on both the product and services. The company has various business segments that include investment, construction, quarry, property, development and utility segment. Okay, now we go through the nature of production process. First is investment segment. DKLS used its property which is Tower 8 Bangsa Taos, a 14-story stratified boutique office building for rental. The next is construction segment. DKLS has over the years spearheaded numerous projects of national, of national significance spanning from highways, bridges, airport runways, uh, water treatment facilities and hydropower plate, uh, plants, chatties, uh, institution, institutional as well as commercial buildings and residential development for both private and uh, public sectors. Third is quarry segment. DKLS quarry and pre number high involved in manufacturing for quarry, ready mix asphaltic concrete and pre products in the northern region of Peninsula Malaysia. DKLS operates its own fleet of concrete mixer trucks, uh, tipo lorries, and machineries to deliver their product efficiently. Fourth is property development segment. DKLS pursue aggressively privatization project as well as joint venture with landowners. The division boasts its performance through a series of development projects in Perak. DKLS property division consists of two companies, which is DKLS Development Number High and DKLS um, Premier Homes Number High. And lastly, its utility segment, DKLS Clearwater Number High, a wholly owned subsidy of DKLS, is a major shareholder of Saban DKLS Water Supply Company Limited (STWS), holding 70% equity. STWS is a joint venture privatization scheme with Nampapa Saban Nakat Province state-owned enterprise holding 30% shares. STWS is responsible to operate, manage and distribute treated water to all domestic accounts as well as commercial and industrial premise in the Kaisan Form Vihan district of Saban Nakat Province, Lao PDR. Alright, next is types of segment. Operating segments may be a business or geographical segment. As for DKLS Industries Berhad, the business segments comprise of investment holding, construction, which is building and general contractors, quarry, property development, and utilities. The geographical segment comprise the Malaysia Lao People's Democratic Republic. Other operations of the group mainly comprise trading of construction materials and logging and sales of merchantable timbers, none of which constitutes a separate reportable segment.
Alright, lastly, let me explain about CODM and its responsibilities. Chief Operating Decision Maker CODM are not necessarily to a manager with a specific title, but rather to a function. Often, the Chief Operating Decision Maker of an entity is its Chief Executive Officer or Chief Operating Officer. However, it may be a group or executive directors or others. Um, that person can be the Chief Executive Officer, CEO, Chief Operating Officer, COO, Chief Financial Officer, CFO, or others. Referring to the KLS Industries Berhad Annual Report, it's concluded that Mr. Ding Poi Po, the Managing Director, is the CODM of the company. This is seen clearly as the scope of responsibilities of the Managing Director includes overall responsibilities over the operating units, organizational effectiveness and implementations of bots policies and decisions. The functions of CODM is firstly to decide on the allocations of resources, for example, to allocate material, labor, and inventories to ensure operations of business can be run smoothly. Secondly, assessing the performance of the operating segments of the entity, for example, um, assess the reputations of every segment in the company and determine which segment needs improvements or to be shut down. Hi, I'm Nora Anisha, so I would like to present to you about a reportable segment of DKLS Industries Berhad. DKLS Industries Berhad have six segments. The first one is investment, second one is construction, next is quarry, property development, utilities, and others. So, we need to calculate it if it more than threshold, which is 10% threshold, then it is a reportable segment. For investment, I will do an uh, example for investment. We need to take the amount and divide it by the total asset. Then multiply by 100. So, for the investment, we will get 28.4%. So, it is more than 10%. If it more than 10%, it will be a reportable segment. For investment, there will be a reportable segment. Next, for the construction, it is more than 10% too. So, it will be a reportable statement. Same as quarry, property, development and utilities. There is more than 10%. So, this is reportable statement. Unfortunately, for the others, it is less than 10%. So, for the others, it will be non-reportable statement. So, we can conclude that DKLS Industries Berhad have five, five, uh, six segments that will be five reportable segments and one other which is non-reportable segment. So, we will proceed to the 75% rule, which is after determining the reportable segment, the company need to ensure that the reportable segment that attributable to the revenue is greater than 75% of the total revenue. So, the 75% rule is investment, investment revenue, plus with the construction, quarry, property development, and utilities. After add on this all, we need to divide it by the total revenue. This one is this one is only for the external revenue. After doing this, we need to ensure that it gets 75 cents. After calculate we get 
88.56%. So, it is greater than 75%. If it is greater than 75%, we don't need to add another segment which is others. We just go on with this. So, this is the final answer for the 75% rules. So, for the last part, this will be the report for the disclosing reportable segment. So, we got the sixth segment which is property development, investment, construction, quarry, utilities and others. Then, we need to put the total assets here. Revenue, which is external sales and inter-segment sales. And lastly, results, which is the profit of the company. Segmental reporting is used by company to help assess better the nature and financial effects of the business the entity operates. The company should disclose information to enable users of financial statement evaluate financial reports. There are several advantages and disadvantages depend on how the information is used. So, we will move on to the first advantage, which is separation of profitable segment. DKS operate business and geographical segment. Therefore, segment report can distinguish segment that give more profit. The evaluation of change in strategic direction for the manager to make a future decision. Next, the second advantage is decentralized business. Many business have multiple sectors and decentralization. A financial applied does not critique a company, but it remarks on the leadership. For the last advantage is improved context. Segment reporting allows stakeholders to get a better sense of the fluctuation that might affect overall profit. Segment reporting helps DKLS by showing this earning coming and helps stakeholders to determine if the earning sustains. Next, we will move to the disadvantage. The first disadvantage is limitation that it emphasizes on the presence. Segment reporting plays too much focus on short-term number. For example, if DKLS run a significant deficit before the right people is infrastructure are in place, the loose incurred will give negative impression of financial statement. The second disadvantage is data manipulation. Cemental reporting's information can be manipulated as it may be reported through the new that man management wants users to see. Therefore, users of financial statement will get false ideas of performance of the company. So that's all from me. Thank you. My name is Nur Anya Binti Nuzaki. Now, I will explain about Part B, which is Interim Report MFRS 134. The basis of preparation of Interim Report is the financial statements of the group and of the company have been prepared in accordance with Malaysian Financial Reporting Standards MFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards IFRS, and the requirements of the Companies Act 2016 in Malaysia. At the beginning of the current financial year, the group and the company adopted new and amended MFRS which are mandatory for financial periods beginning on or after the dates. The financial statements have been prepared on a historical cost basis unless otherwise it is stated in the summary of significant of accounting policies. The financial statements are presented in Ringgit Malaysia RM. Okay, next, I will explain the two accounting policies used in preparing the financial interim report. The first one is the definition of a business uh, amendments to MFRS 3 business combination. The amendment to MFRS 3 clarifies um, that to be considered as a business, an integrated set of activities and assets must include 
uh, it must include at a minimum an input and a substantive process that together significantly contributed to the ability to create the output. Um, furthermore, it clarifies that a business can exist without including all of the inputs and processes needed to create the outputs. Um, these amendments uh, had no impact on the consolidated financial statement of the group, but it may impact uh, on the future period should the group enter into any business combinations. The accounting policies used to prepare the financial uh, interim report is the interest rate benchmark reform. Amendments to 3 MFRS, which is MFRS 9 financial instruments, MFRS 139 financial instruments recognition and measurement, and MFRS 7 financial instruments disclosures. The amendments to MFRS 9, MFRS 139 and MFRS 7 provide a number of reliefs which apply to all hedging relationships that are directly affected by interest rate benchmark reform. A hedging relationship is affected uh, if the reform gives rise to the uncertainty about the timing and or amount of benchmark based cash flows of the hedge items or the hedging uh, instrument. Uh, these amendments uh, have no impact on the consolidated financial statements uh, of the group as it does not have any interest rate hedging relationship. The types of interim report uh, by the company is quarterly uh, interim financial reporting. The dates are 26 February 2020, 29th May 2020, 24 August 2020, and 23rd November 2020. My name is Aina Safiah Binti Alias. And now, I'm going to show you the current and cooperative of each financial statement prepared by DKL as per head. So now, let's start off with Statement of Comprehensive Income, SOCHI. We got four rows here, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter because DKLS apply the quarterly basis. So first quarter is from February to April, second quarter is May to July, Third quarter is from August to October and fourth quarter, the last one is from November to January. So there are current, comparative current, year to date and comparative year to date. For the first quarter, we have to put Sochi for quarter ended 30th April 2020 since it is the current year. So we, we put 2020 and then same goes for the second quarter, Sochi for quarter ended 31st July. Since it's ended in July, right? So, it's just the same. 2020 because it is current. All of the current one, we put 20, 2020, 2020, 2020, and 2020. Simple, right? The only difference is that in the terms of months. See, when the first quarter ended on April, so we have to put 30th April. The second quarter ended in July, we have to put 31st July. The third quarter ended in October, we put 31st October And the last one, it ended in January So 31st December Oh, okay, but this one, it has something wrong Because it was supposed to end it in 2021 Because it is the next year Okay, so next we have the comparative current Sochi for quarter ended 30th April 2019 this one is current year, so it's 2020. So, comparative current, we compare with the year before, the previous year, before the current year. This one, the current year is 2020. So, the comparative current, which is the previous year, is 2019. So, all of this, we put 2019. Except for this one, it, uh, we put 2020 because the current is 2021. So, we have to put 2020 here. The only thing that is different between the, the four quarters is that the month. 
Here is 30th April since it ended on April. This one is 31st July since it ended in July. This one is 31st October. And the last one, it ended in 31st January 2020 because it ended here November to January. And I made a mistake just now. I put here December, 31st December 2021. But it's actually wrong. It's 31st January 2021. I made a mistake just now, I'm sorry. Okay, now let's move on to the third column, which is year to date. Year to date is just kind of the same thing. But the only difference is that it says here, three months ended. So for the first quarter, Sochi for the three months ended 30th April 2020. Since this is three months because February to April. It's three months, right? February, March, and April. And this one, six months because from February to July. February, March, April, May, June, July. Six, right? And same goes for this, 9 and 12. And then the year, as you can see, it's all the same. It's all in 2020 because it is current year. Okay, for the next one, comparative year to date. Sochi for the three months ended 30th April 2019. The only difference here is that the year because this is a comparative and this is only year to date. So year to date is the current one and comparative. Comparative mean the previous year. So the previous year is 2019. So cheap for the three months ended 30th April 2019. So cheap for the six months ended 31st July 2019. So cheap for the nine months ended 31st October 2019. So cheap for the 12 months ended 31st January 2020. So that is all of this statement of comprehensive income. Okay, next, for statement of financial position, soft B, we have the first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, and fourth quarter here. The condensed SOFP as at current year, for first quarter is 30th April 2020, and the comparative, which is the previous year, 2019. The month is always 31st January. For comparative, for statement of financial position. Okay, so for the second quarter, the current one, since it ended in July, it's 31st July 2020 and the comparative is still 31st January 2019, same as the previous one and same as all the quarters. Third quarter, it ended in October, so current is 31st October 2020 and the comparative is still 31st January 2019. And the last one is fourth quarter, November until January. The current one is 31st January 2021 since it ended in January. And the comparative is 31st January 2020 which is the previous year. Okay, so for statement of changes in equity, condensed SOCI, S-O-C-I-D, as at the current year is 30th April 2020 and the comparative is 30th April 2019. The month is just the same, April and April. The date is also the same, 30th and 30th. But the year, the current year is 2020 and the comparative year is 2019. So it's different from statement of financial position just now. The second quarter, May to July, current is 31st July 2020 and the comparative is same as well, 31st July but 2019. The year is different. This one is also the same, the year is different. The current is 31st October 2020 and the comparative is 31st October 2019. And the last one is also the same, current 31st January 2021 and the comparative is still 31st January 2020. It's the same month and date but in a different year. Okay, so now statement of cash flows. Same condensed statement of cash flows as at current year 31st, 30th April 2020 and the comparative is also 30th April 2019. This is exactly the same as statement of changes in equity. And the second one, current is 31st July 2020 and the comparative is 31st July 2019. The third quarter is current 31st October 2020, comparative 31st October 2019, and finally the fourth quarter is current year 31st January 2021, and comparative 31st January 2020. The question that I came up with is the lights were high 
prepares interim half leave report and its financial year ended on 31st December 2020. D discuss how the following items will be treated in the interim reports. So for the first question, Delights depreciates its motor vehicles at 10% by using straight line method. The cost of the motor vehicles as at 30th June 2020 was 15 million 500,000 ringgit. On 1st July 2020, the entity made a purchase of another van with the cost of 1 million ringgit. Okay, so let's see how to do it. So the first one, we have to search for the depreciation. First, we have to take the cost. So the cost of the vehicles as at 30th June. This one is 30th June, right? So 30th June was 50,500,000. So we take 50,500,000 and we put it here. And then times with the depreciation percentage, which is 10%. So we will get 1,550,000 ringgit. So that is the depreciation of motor vehicles as at the DF June 2020. Okay, now let's move on to the depreciation 31st December 2020. So, so we just put 1550,000 and then we plus with since on 1st July 2020, the entity made a purchase of another van with the cost of 1 million ringgit so we put the cost here 1 million this one is to calculate the depreciation on another van so 1 million times with 10 percent and then we have to times with 6 over 12 and then we will get This one is 1550,000 plus, and we have to calculate this one, and then we will get 50000 So you can press your calculator, and we will get 1600. So we will get 1600000 for the depreciation as at the first. December. Okay, now for the extraction of financial statement, I choose statement of financial position. So this one is statement of financial position as at 30th June 2020 and this one is statement of financial position as at 31st December 2020 because this is a half year basis. We have the first half year and the second half year. So for the 30th June, non-current assets, motor vehicles since motor vehicle is a non-current asset, right? So motor vehicles, the amount is 15,500,000. And then minus with the depreciation that we calculate just now, we got 1,550,000 ringgit. So if we minus motor vehicles with its depreciation, we got 13,950,000 ringgit. And for the SOFI as at 31st December 2020, under non-current assets, we got motor vehicles which is this amount, we put it here, 13,950,000 ringgit. And then we add with new motor vehicles, which is the new motor vehicles, the cost is 1 million ringgit, right? So we put 1 million ringgit here, and we minus the depreciation of this new motor vehicles, which is 50 million that we got, we got from the calculation that we did just now. So if we calculate all of this, we will get 40,900,000 ringgit. Here is the second adjustment. Delight has paid for its utilities until the end of the year, which is 31st December 2020. This entity uses half yearly basis. The total amount of utilities that has to be paid by the entity on 30th June 2020 is 450,000 ringgit only. However, the entity paid a total amount of 300,000 ringgit for the whole year on 30th June 2020. This one ended on 30th June and this one ended on 31st December. Under the current assets, because it is advanced utilities, we put here 300,000 ringgit because it paid 300,000 ringgit on 30th June 2020. Meanwhile, for statement of financial position, as at 31st December 
December 2015. Under current assets, we put advanced utilities. The one that we put in Sofi on 31st December is 150,000. So I think that is all from me. Thank you.